Hello, and welcome to the OARC series on, on high-performance computing. And today, I'm going to be talking about the uh, Hoffman Cluster and Digital Humanities work, or Digital Humanities and the HPC. So let me share my screen, and we will get started. All right. So what we're going to talk about today is basically a little bit of background on digital humanities and data or what we're doing and why we actually need resources like the Hoffman to actually do our research. Uh, an overview of the Hoffman 2 cluster, what it is, how we use it, how you sign up for it, how you create an account, how it's basically a very painless process to become part of this. And then I'll show you some how, how to use Hoffman in practical terms for digital humanities. And I'll be um, really using two examples of this, of projects I've worked on, one being a analysis of Twitter data, and another one being an analysis of basically least cost pathing or finding ways to walk through really complex digital elevation models. So the first thing I wanna start with is what is going on with digital humanities and data? As you can see here, data is pretty much like trebles for humanities. There's lots of it, it's always multiplying, and it's fuzzy, and it gets everywhere, and it's a mess. And what do I mean by that? We are in a data glut. We have digital elevation data. We have millions of lines of Twitter. We've got more digitized objects than we've ever had before. And so really, for humanities, we are facing a situation where we might actually have too much stuff to look at and too much stuff to handle. Our personal machines can only look at so much data before their processors don't work, or we need to have more storage space, more RAM, or more computational power. And so that's kind of where we're going. We have access to lots of wonderful resources. But we have to have different ways of looking at them and working with them. Um, as an example, we can get, I have digital elevation data for the entire earth. Um, we have this from like things like the shuttle research, missions, but my laptop cannot actually access all that at once. It can't look at all that at once. I have to do this in small chunks. And for a lot of our research, especially when we look at things like larger networks or huge data sets, that's not very satisfying. We need to look at the whole thing at once. Bringing up this discussion that you have data. A lot of humanities people don't really think of their research in terms of data, but it's there. If you have lists of places of people, that's data. Your notes, the things that you take, that's data, maps, text. But again, you have all this. You may not think of it as data. And now that you may think of it as data, you may not be able to access it all. You may not be able to process it all. And that's really the quandary that we're facing. An example problem for this is this thing I worked on for the uh, no DAPL or the uh, protests against the Dakota Access Pipeline. And the objectives here that I had for this were to see what uh, networks were forming around the protest and resistance groups, especially networks that were in, say, digital and social media. And I really wanted to look at grassroots use of technologies for social justice. How are people using Twitter? How are people using these kind of media to form collective networks, to talk about these issues, to form communities? And just to show you my first project, I'd use the uh, API, which at the time you could actually access Twitter data directly through the API. And it pulled in, as you can see here, the numbers. Um, I got 133,000 nodes. These are different kinds of people. These are different kinds of objects, which were all linked together by 630,393 edges. And that was about the extent that my laptop was able to handle. I have anything more than that, and it would just take too long to process. Um, looking at this stuff as a network actually took me hours upon hours to just process this data and to get it into a network form. And then it would take, I would basically say, hey, I wanna find this kind of measurement. I'd get it started, I'd go, I'd make lunch, I'd clean my apartment, I'd do something else, I'd come back and maybe a few hours have gone by and I have the measurement that I want. And the whole time I had to keep the laptop running, it sounded like there was an airplane taking off. It, there was a lot of heat issues. This project really showed me, I was hitting the limitations of what my computational technology was allowing me to do. And it really wasn't, in terms of big data, that big of a data set. Again, we're only talking about, say, 630,000 top tweets. These are Those are the edges that are linked together. And so 
this is just a problem. And the other problem was I discovered many issues with the API that I wanted to address that I don't think I was getting all the data that Twitter had to offer. And any more than that, though, how was I going to look at it? How was I going to actually process it? And that was a problem that I just couldn't, I couldn't get around at that point. So what was my next steps for my project? Well, I wanted to look at a more comprehensive data source. I wanted to get all of the tweets, which were about something not just limited by the API. Uh, I spent all of my research money to get two weeks of Twitter data on no Dapple. And I got, as you can see the numbers here, over 60 gigabytes of compressed text files, which led to about 7.4 million tweets. And as you can tell, this is a lot larger than the data set that I was just using. So I had this, I finally had the data. I finally had the access to stuff I wanted, but how was I going to process something which was so much larger than my previous file? How would I actually look at this stuff in a way that I could use? And so how do you handle this kind of data? Well, one of the things I want to do is I wanted to put it into a Jupyter notebook because I want to be able to visualize it. I want to show the networks. I want to show the code. I also wanted the code to be somewhat portable so that if I'm writing it in Python, I can do different things with it. I can share this data with people. We can all come to the It's reusable. You can actually see where I'm going with it and that it could be used in ways tying together multiple programs, multiple platforms. So I wanted it to be in Python. I want it to be in a notebook. I want to, to be able to interact with it. And so, again, I can't do this on my own machine. All right. Another example of a project is this idea of least cost paths. And this was, I was interested in looking at how you move around in different places in pre-modern Anatolia, which is uh, modern day Turkey. So in other words, I want to see how people can move through this terrain. I have really detailed satellite terrain. I have old maps. I have old maps of say roads, but these roads and route files are digitized to scale of 1.1 to 1 million at the best, which means they're really not that accurate. You'll see places where roads go over mountains or through rivers or around places they shouldn't go. I wanted to actually get a better idea of how people move through this landscape and how this landscape connects people around. And how do you do that? Well, preliminary work, this is all done again with the, with the roads. So it's routes that are already there. And again, this took hours and hours for my machine to produce. I would go through, it would look at all the points, it would draw connections between them, stack them together, to reduce a uh, work like this. But again, it's it's just too difficult for me to, to do what I really want to do, which is thousands of points and thousands upon thousands of lines in Anatolia, really to build a foot network. And again, I can't really do that. And so how do I, I want to look at the slope. I want to look at the terrain. I want to look at, again, where over 250,000 places are on here. And I want to find paths from each one to each one, way beyond what my actual machine can do. And so this is an example of what I want to actually come up with. And this is just one little path that cuts through. And you can see here, one little path, digital elevation. And this took, I believe, five hours to produce this one little image. Um, if you do the math of 250,000 places, each one connected to each other, you get an idea of what the pro the scale of the problem is here. And again, I can't get past the first steps of that. I can't really, beyond doing that first path, I can't push beyond what I need to do. So, and I've got huge files too. These uh, digital elevation ones are gigabytes upon gigabytes. This image here is a two gigabyte image. And you can see how this starts to just stack in terms of computational needs in case of data needs. And these, there's other considerations too. Most of us cannot leave our laptop sitting there running, doing computationally heavy things for days at a time. You either burn out, you might burn out your fans, you might have a power interruption, you might have to go to work, you might have to move the, the machine. And so that's a big problem with trying to do this stuff on your own. And again, the other issues here, reproducibility and sustainability, your particular machine and how you've configured it to run these things may not be something that is generally applicable. People may not be able to duplicate what it is that I did to get this thing to run. And so I need to have that as a consideration 
how do people run the code that I have? So where do we go from here? And this is how you really want to treat any digital humanities project when you start to get these issues. I've identified my problem. What do I want to solve? How do I want to solve? I've identified what I want to happen. I have a problem of data. I've got, a, I want to build a network. I've got a problem of elevation data. I want to build a route. Okay. I'm willing to do some, a minimum of extra coding to get this to work. And so what's my solution? My solution is to use the Hoffman cluster here at UCLA. And you can see the uh, link here, which will get into the history of it. But uh, basic things about the Hoffman um, computational cluster, there's over 21,000 cores of, of performance there. So that's fantastic. There we have just across 1,300 um, performance compute nodes. We have, as you can see here, numbers of 76 terabytes of memory. We have a petabytes of high performance network storage. Basically, this is a lot more powerful than anything that we have access to on your laptop. Anything that more, anything you have access to in your departments, this is going to be probably the biggest thing that you can access to run these kinds of numbers. And you have a little picture of it in the corner there. And it's really, and it's fun. It's kind of on the other side of the door of where I work. So we're pretty close to Hoffman. So how does it work? How, okay, it's a supercomputer. How do you even use this for humanities? And this is where we're going now. Well, what you do is you log into the system and then you say, I want to either run something like a Jupyter Notebook, which is an interactive shell, or I want to use a script to put my job on a scheduler. What does that mean? Well, that means that I'm either typing and seeing in real time what I'm doing, or I'm writing scripts saying, I want all these steps to happen. And then I send it to the computer where eventually, when it frees up the memory, and I get it as a part of the queue. When it goes to my turn, it executes the code, does all the scripting work, puts things where it should be, and sends me a notification that it's done. And you can do this through SSH, which you may be familiar with, or other connecting options. In fact, I, I like to use CyberDuck because it's to move my files around, because it's a nice visual interface. And some things to keep in mind, the bigger your job, the more memory and cores you ask for, the longer you might have to wait. Generally, on this default, Hoffman immediately starts up, get, it dumps you where you want to go. But if you have really intense jobs where you need a lot of memory, you might have to wait a little bit for these things to kick off. Another wonderful thing is because you log into this stuff and it's not on your actual personal machine, you can do things like, again, launch a job then just pack up and go and leave. This stuff is running on Hoffman. It's not running locally. So once you start your job, once you start these things going, there's no reason why you have to be connected or tying up your own machine and that kind of work. You can go do something else. And so that's extremely useful. All right. So what about you? Well, as a UCLA affiliate, you can create a user account on the system for absolutely free. No cost to you whatsoever. And what... All you need to do is find a sponsor. Now we have faculty sponsors. Um, there's some of us are sponsors as well. Or if you actually are eligible to be a PI in a grant, you yourself can be a, can be a sponsor. All this is on the Hoffman page. Um, what does it give you at a base level, base account? You have 40 gigabytes in your home directory, which is there as long as you're at UCLA. No one touches it, no one deletes it, no one does anything with it. You may see that's not much, fine. You have two terabytes of scratch space. And this is stuff where you can dump files, but every two weeks it gets everything gets deleted. So this is where like I like to do is, you know, use the um, gigabytes, the 40 gigabytes as my stable stuff. Here's the scripts I'm working on. Here's some of my final products. And terabytes to actually run the scratch space to run some of these larger jobs where it produces something like, say, a digital elevation map, which I then pull down and I'm able to use on my own. There are also other storage solutions available. It's something like $150 a year per terabyte. So the storage space is fairly cheap. And so you can keep buying space if you need it. And that space is, again, yours and will not be deleted. So that's the basics of a Hoffman account. And you can see all the way here, this is the requesting an account. You can see the wonderful overview on the Hoffman documentation about this how you register again for a sponsor or register yourself as a sponsor. And if you have any questions, the Hoffman team can take you through this. So it's all very self-explanatory and again, very richly detailed and documented. So once you've created an account, you've been approved and you have that all process, 
what where do you go from there? What's on Hoffman? What can you do? Well, let's take a look here. And so we will sign, we'll take a look. And if we sign on to, and let me stop sharing a minute here and then re and then we'll share the screen so you can see SSH into Hoffman. Yes, I'm actually right now in Hoffman. And you'll see that I this is my home directory. And I've got a few different, a few different things that I've done here. But let me just exit that for a second. And if I, this is how you get in. I'm logging in SSH. Uh, that is my username at Hoffman. And again, I have it set up, so I just jump right in. And now if I issue this command, all apps, this tells me everything that Hoffman has installed by default. And you'll see that it is quite an extensive list. And we have lots of things on here. So the ones that are really going to concern us today are we have Python. You'll see Python there. We have GDAL, which is the um, geospatial data kit. We have um, R, if you're into R. We have a, a um, projection libraries. We have Java. And so we have a lot of things that are actually really accessible to you as a user. All right. Now to jump back on the... Uh, all right, we had a little hiccup there for a second, but we will continue. So let me share the screen and go back to here. All right, perfect. Now, so the essential idea is that most of the code that you've already worked on in terms of say Python or the other things that you're, you have in your system will actually just work straight out of the box on Hoffman. And this really can increase the time you spend doing your research again, instead of waiting on your system to do anything. So let's get started looking at this and looking how your code can actually be brought into Hoffman. So let's look at, again, this Dakota Access Pipeline project I had. So I had all these terabytes, gigabytes upon gigabytes of files. And so I brought them into my scratch space because they are much larger than my home directory. And so... I wanted to get, so I got them to scratch base, but now I want to get them into this environment that I'm more comfortable with, which will help me with my analysis. And so what do I mean by that? Again, I like Jupyter Notebooks. I like them to be, because they are accessible, people can see what I'm doing, and my code is right there to look at. And what's wonderful about Hoffman is it supports Jupyter right off the bat. And so they have a, a sample script here. You can see H2, Jup, and B, and all your all you have to really do is set some parameters for it. And you can see that right here. And let me show you what that means. So if we would go here, it tells you the Hoffman 2 documentation shows you exactly how to use the, these kind of this kind of connections. And also shows you what some of your parameters are. And so you can have a you can ask for again a default amount of memory or and RAM. Or if you know that you're going to be really computationally expensive, you can actually modify this a little bit. And it tells you how here how to do that and ask for more RAM and more memory cores. And so, and the, again, the, the documentation is really extensive. And what you do is once you start it, I have one right here. There we go. Now I switch to the Jupyter Lab environment just by simply typing lab at the end of my Jupyter one. And you can see there we have everything put, put together. So that, this is pretty painless. And I think this is probably... One of the best ways, if you've never used high-performance computing, and if you have a lot of stuff to, to deal with, I think Jupyter Notebooks is probably your best bet to really start to approach what Hoffman can do for you. Because if we pull and get my notebook here, we'll see that I've got, I've already got my stuff, and I'm not going to rerun it because this takes a little bit of time, but you'll see that I've pulled all of my tweets into one CSV file which I've then taken that CSV file and put it into a into a data frame so that this thing is actually right now live running off of Hoffman by 7.4 million line CSV file. And look, I can go through, I can tell you what the columns are. I can pull up any individual one of these things. I can start running stats on it. I can, I can tell you 
look at the like what are the number of retweets that this thing has what if i put it in order of who is retweeted the most and you can see all of this data again i've got 7.4 million lines of this and there is i can run my histograms i can run all whatever i want on it as a spreadsheet and so instead of making my computer sit there and cry you can see i can actually use jupiter i can use uh, in this case pandas to look at this file i would never be able to do this ever uh, on my own on my own machine like i would never be able to just say you know oh go to like line 800 oh whoops i i guess i better just reload it while we're talking yeah, I would never be able to load any of this stuff. And this will take, it takes a few minutes to load, but the, those few minutes is supposed to like, you know, days on your own machine. So this is really, I, I'd say for probably 90% of you who've never dealt with high performance computing or the kind of things that you can do with the Hoffman cluster, I'd say start with the Jupyter Notebooks. Start putting stuff, your huge files into the scratch space, run, run this stuff, and that you'll be able to actually get your head around like all this stuff. I, I wasn't able to see any of this in the kind of order I was until I brought it into Jupiter. And now I can, again, look at each one of my 7.4 million lines and break it down and get each little individual thing that I want out of there. And in doing that, I discovered that the uh, actual first several thousand, so my top several thousand tweets had absolutely nothing to do with what I was trying to look at and just became something about uh, Harry Styles and a butterfly tattoo. That had absolutely nothing to do with, no doubt, with my analysis. I wouldn't have known that until I put them all into this kind of thing. And what's great about this is I can start pulling them out. So this will allow you to show things like um, tables of graphs and things that I couldn't actually read on my own machine. And again, I can do that just through Hoffman. It, well, and again, some considerations for this is you might have to play around with the memory to get enough computational power. You can use it like I did, which was I took all of my stuff, pulled it into one actual CSV file, which I could then pull back and access. And it turned out from 60 gigabytes to about 25 gigabytes. So I should have saved a lot of room by using Hoffman to actually compress my files to the point where they could be used by other people. And so this allows me to do all kinds of basic, powerful operations on my data, which I normally would not be able to do. So that is one way of using Hoffman and looking at what Hoffman can do. Another thing is, again, the Dakota Access one. And this is where my files really were too big. And I really could not handle them on my own machine. And I couldn't run that, the things in a timely manner. Um, I had to put these things into Scratch and then pull them off. And this is where an FTP client is really, really useful. And if you haven't seen it before, basically it's a visual way of pulling in data or pushing out data that you may need. And so let me just show you the one that I like to use. I like to use something called Cyberduck because it's one, it's open source. Two, it, it, two, it has an image of a duck on it. And so if we go in, say to, I have these set for Hoffman to my home directory and my scratch directory. And all I need to do is go in there and you'll see that I've got my all of my files, my directory. And here's my all tweets CSV. That's the one I was just explaining. See, 26 gigabytes. Uh, that's down from 64. And if I go into things like Anatolia, this is where I was doing all my turkey work. And you'll see, all, uh, quite a number of files in here. And things like 6.3 gigabytes of files, 7.5, 7.5. Um, and these paths, there's even more of them. Each one of these is a nearly two gigabyte file. And this is all done in the scratch space, me pulling things back and forth with this FTP client. All right. And so how do you do this? How do you actually pull these things off? Well, the order that I found to be really useful 
is to basically first write and test the scripts in your home environment. Say, hey, does this thing, you know, I need a script going through all of these different elevation files. Let me test them on smaller versions of it to see the procedure works before I put them on the Hoffman. You really want to troubleshoot as many issues as possible before you start a job in Hoffman. So you don't want to wait in the queue. Finally, you have your turn and the thing blows up in two seconds. You don't want that. You want to ensure that all the required software and libraries are on Hoffman and are on your machine. And this actually became an issue with the geospatial data abstraction library. And I have a workshop on, upcoming on this where I detail how I actually solved this problem of getting different versions of the software, which Hoffman does have, to actually talk to each other. So some of the libraries require certain other libraries to be on a certain at a level. Excuse me. And you can actually pull that off in Hoffman. Okay. And you, so you may say, well, this all sounds great, but I don't even know where to start. Again, the GIS data visualization group, that's group I belong to, we can help you through the, how we do this with GIS. The Hoffman team can help you with the basic functionalities of Hoffman. And this is where you really can get started on this kind of work. So let's go back to this GIS. How do we do this? How do we look at some of the, our scripts? Well, let me share them with you. And if we look at, bring up the basic idea is this is a script that starts, and again, all of this is um, detailed and demoed on Hoffman, uh, on the Hoffman documentation. And if you look here, this is Anatolia.sh, and this is my one that actually starts the job. And what I, this is all things that are that are, again are templates and that that are there are automatically for me. What I had to do was um, tell it which modules I need to load for the job. In my case, a specific version of Python and a specific version of Gnome. Where to run the command? So I said, you know, go to my scratch directory where all my stuff lo looks at. Then run, we're using Python 3, run this script. And that's my that's the job I'm submitting, that I want Hoffman to run this, this particular Python file. And so what does that Python look like? What does that file look like? It looks like this. It is a typical Python file. You'll see that I have different kinds of imports. And then I say, you know, bring in any of the required packages that I need. We need a comp very complex GeoJSON file, and then start making a graph, pulling in my digital elevation, and then calculating all this edge weight, the nodes, the ge geometries, and when it's all done, give an output pass file. This is a very straightforward um, script, and it's one that I can test at home with really small versions of these files. But again, the big versions were just too much for my laptop to handle. So once I know that this thing works, which I which I got it to work again on very small files. Then I go, then I set up this script, and then I issue a bat, a job request to Hoffman. And we'll get into what that looks like right now. And so this is, so again, there's two versions. There's the interactive shell and there's these batch jobs. The interactive shell is good for troubleshooting. Like if I was doing this code, and it worked at home, I issued a batch job and it failed. May, all right, let me grab my smaller test data, put it on Hoffman, and then start running this very quickly interactive shell to see where the problems are. All right. And again, the bad thing with these interactive ones is I can't run them overnight. I I don't have the computational power that I do with the with these um, batch jobs. Batch jobs are where, again, you almost always submit it, forget it. Like I put in my script, I say, when are you ready to run it? Run it, let me know. Um, these may fail if you're not paying attention. Like I just said, maybe there's a problem in your code. That's why you want to test it first. But Hoffman has wonderful logging system. And it's really easy to tell where your problems are at in your script. And so I've had things fail. And, and if they fail, they'll fail quickly. But I'll see the log. And the log will then tell me, this is where I need to go. This is this, where I need to look at my script. This is what I need to fix. And again, the Hoffman documentation is, you can see here, submitting batch jobs. They'll tell you exactly how you, step-by-step, step, with examples like the script I just showed you, how to actually do this. So 
with that said, what do some of these logs look like? Well, let me pull one up for you. A basic log looks something like this. It'll tell you when your job has started. It'll tell you, oh, right here was my problem. I had a warning, but that the job actually executed pretty well. Then you'll find other jobs, which will actually give you things like errors. Let me see if I got one here. This is this is an error. And you'll see that I had, oh, right here, and no module. That was easy enough for me to solve. I'd find this no module thing and then solve it. And so it's really straightforward to start getting your data into there and to start actually accessing and using Hoffman. And that's really the encouragement that I want you to have from this session is that no matter what you have, if you're used to using, again, the shell, if you're used to using Python, if you're used to using uh, Jupyter Notebooks, it's all extremely easy to get started and to get this stuff up and into Hoffman. So with that, I hope that you have good, a good time using it. I hope that this has opened up a new world of high-performance computing and data wrangling and data access and analysis for you and your research. Thank you.